reliable medical necessity. I think that's where the legislation is needed. Now, if I can just introduce something further into this, I'd like us to hold together the uh, relationship between an emergency and a crisis. Now, my understanding of a crisis is that a succession of decisions, because that's actually what a crisis is, a succession of decisions puts together a protocol which underpins um, actions which are taken in an emergency situation. And this, I think, is where we tie together uh, the range of moral expressions and theological frameworks that we've heard this morning with the medical delivery and the nursing delivery, the human responsibility and conscience, and the contributions which faith groups and others who are not members of world faiths make to a democracy. These are the sort of things I would like to say in response to that. Of course, theology develops, um, but so also, I think, does the understanding of embryology. So I think we need to be very careful that a number of things is moving forward organically, and I think the important thing for a democracy is to keep these balls in the air. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Salim. <clears throat> Uh, with regard to the issue of abnormality, I don't think abnormality could be deemed as a reason on the basis of which uh, abortion could be conducted, because if we say abnormality, what level of abnormality are we talking about? And are we suggesting abnormality because an abnormal child will be a burden on the family or a burden on the society? Or are you expecting that an abnormal child will have a miserable wife? You say, well, there are a lot of healthy, wealthy people who lead very miserable life and it ends up by committing suicide. See, uh, the other point for society and accusing women of lying, I, I don't think that this is the basis on which we Muslims do not uh, agree with, uh, uh, with legislation uh, for abortion because a woman threatens to commit suicide. But uh, we think that it is an issue that should be considered from a medical point of view, the grounds on, on the basis of which uh, that lady uh, threatens to commit, to commit suicide should be taken into consideration and should be taken out. A lot of people who threaten to commit suicide on the basis of so many other things, and if the answer to the question is, okay, here is what you want because you threaten to commit suicide, I think it will turn into an anarchy. And Ms. Stanley? Women have equal human rights they have equal human rights with men. We have the equal right to life, we have the equal right to health, and we have the equal right to physical and psychological integrity. In some countries in the world, and Ireland is one of them, women, pregnant women, don't have the equal right to health. They don't have the equal right to physical and psychological inter integrity, and we want to see that changed. Thank you. Ms. Good, yeah. um, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the I'd just like to reiterate that we are very keen um, to have legislation in, for the X case. We do not believe that this will open the doors for um, abortion on demand. I think Irish women, Irish men, Irish families, Irish couples are far smarter than that to let this come into the country. But I think we cannot have the situation that we have now continue. Doctors need security and clarity over this issue. Women need security and clarity and safety over this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Reverend Jim. With, with regard to, to the issue of the decision of the Supreme Court and the X case and the use of potential suicide as a criteria. I, I am not convinced uh, personally, and this is not a decision of our church, that a, a further referendum is the response to that. Legislation may be necessary. The difficulty in uh, seeing a potential uh, threat to the life of a mother through suicide, one, um, in terms even of those functioning within the medical profession in this sphere, they recognize that this is extremely subjective in terms of making such a judgment. Uh, secondly, and this has already been discussed at, uh, at previous committee meetings, of the potential of, of abuse. Uh, and uh, I, I think that is a, a real factor at play. Uh, and therefore, uh, for us, 
uh, we, we believe that perhaps this ought not to be uh, legislation may be necessary, referendum may not be the response, but it needs to be considered very, very carefully of the consequences of uh, uh, enacting whatever is required to deal with the decision of the Supreme Court. Thank you. And at this stage, can I welcome uh, Rabbi Lent to our meeting and to apologise for any confusion regarding timing. You're very welcome. And if you want to make your presentation now, you may do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, deputies and senators. Thank you for allowing me time to add the Jewish point of view to the discussion on this truly important and emotive issue. I'm not a medical professional. I'm a religious leader representing the Irish Jewish community guided by the strictures of Jewish law, which we call halacha. I would like to thank the committee for their efforts to bring clarity to these complex issues and for affording me the time to comment. Judaism views every moment of life as being of supreme value. As such, the life of a newborn child and the life of an elderly patient on life support are of no less value than that of a healthy adult in the prime of life. However, a fetus in utero, though inherently valued, is not deemed yet to have assumed an equal status of full life. It is, of course, an incredibly difficult and painful decision to have to terminate a pregnancy. However, in certain cases, Jewish law may permit a termination to take place. This would primarily be when carrying the unborn to term would cause danger and risk to the mother's life. In this instance, the fetus may be considered to be actively threatening the life of the mother, and to save her life, a termination could be permitted and recommended. In circumstances where there is a risk of mental health complications to the mother, potentially leading to a threat to the mother's life, then a termination may also be permitted. This risk would need to be assessed and verified by qualified mental health professionals in conjunction with a competent halachic Jewish law authority. In all cases, the decision to terminate a pregnancy would be a last resort after all other avenues to save both mother and child have been explored. In cases of rape or incest, where carrying to term could cause life-threatening mental health issues for the mother, the same criteria would apply and determination may be permitted. In cases of fetal abnormalities or deformities, the general consensus is that the fetus should be carried to full term with exceptions made where there is no chance of a viable life in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And can I again apologize for the confusion regarding time and you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, could I just remind members that there are now 11 members have indicated uh, that they want to speak and if they could please be brief in asking the question and directing it to a particular church or the atheist organization and if it has been already asked, please don't in, in, engage. So the next speaker, Deputy Maloney. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I will be both uh, uh, brief and, and I have one question, one question uh, only, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and that relates to the, uh, the issue of um, suicide in relation to uh, pregnant women, which uh, has been a theme of all, our, all of our discussions, including this morning. Uh, since we started three days ago. And um, I think that um, they're, they're in the question of, uh, of uh, suicide, it's been alluded to by one or two uh, speakers this morning, I think that uh, we, may not, um, we may not like or we may, may not wish to acknowledge that uh, it's a reality that in some cases, thankfully, thankfully, a very small number of cases where uh, a pregnancy for a, preg a woman who is pregnant in some cases uh, feels threatened that uh, she is challenged by her uh, mental health etc and I think that we as legislators we as legislators irrespective of what the, whether it is three cases or 300 cases we have to we have to take that into consideration and my question to you is this because it's been as I said a theme for the for the various uh, discussions we've had for the three days. Uh, it is sometimes argued by some people that if we as legislators take it to acknowledge that, that the risk of suicide for some women, that if we do that in legislation, it will open the floodgates. Can I say this to you? I don't agree with that. I think it's one of the most insensitive and insulting uh, statements for, for whether it's Irish women or, or otherwise. And can I just ask you, do you share that view? Do you share that view? 
that if we as legislators take the suicide into consideration, Thank you, Deputy. that it is insensitive and, and it should not Thank be allowed. Thank you very to much. Uh, Deputy Senator Melvin Henry. Thank you, Chairperson, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all <coughs> today, and I particularly would like to welcome Bishop, jo Bishop Jones from my own uh, diocese. Uh, and I, I am going to ask two questions to you, Bishop Jones. Um, and the first would be, I listened to the Master of Hollow Street here on Tuesday. Tuesday. She spoke very passionately about her job uh, and what she believes in. She asked us to help her, to help all obstetricians in this country, to legislate um, to protect her in doing her job every day. And she did say she did not want to go to jail. Now, I would like to know, Bishop, what you would say to any obstetrician um, in this country who feel, who feel that way and who are asking us to legislate to protect them. And the other question, I, I, I'm actually quite surprised that you um, feel that uh, we, we should have a referendum to go back to the X case. Um, I, do, I do believe that um, parents in this country, and if you ask them, who have teenage daughters, and if they find themselves in a situation that their daughter has been raped, is pregnant, and we have a difficulty with suicide in this country as it is, but that their daughter finds themselves suicidal. Parents will have to make a decision what they do. And bearing in mind, you give them all the help psychiatric help they need. I know what my decision would be. I know what most parents' decisions would be. And I'd like you to tell me what you would say Thank to those you. parents. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Cullen Brock. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, thank you to all of the people who've made a contribution here this morning. And it's just this issue in relation to regulation and guidelines as opposed to legislation. As someone who's been involved in legal practice for over 25 years, and as someone who identified a defect where regulation was in place and where there was no legislation supporting it, that identifying that problem subsequently cost, uh, in my own office, cost the Department of Health 485 million. Um, and likewise, in this situation, uh, there's a submission here this morning that would be regulation and guidelines. I'm just wondering what legislation would that, or sorry, what, under what legislation would those regulations and guidelines be brought in? And isn't it true that if there's regulation only, which doesn't have supporting legislation, then that's more likely to be challenged from a constitutional point of view far faster than legislation. Legislation is definite and decisive. And finally, can I just ask, in relation to Article 43, subsection 3, it clearly identifies that the state and its laws must, in so far as practical, protect the life of the unborn. How can any legislation overrule that section. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Catherine Byrne. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you all for coming in this morning. And I have to say the last three days has been probably the most enlightening part of my public life to, present, to this present day. Your Grace, um, I read all your submission. I've read all the submissions, uh, but I was really taken back by your own submission and some of the disturbing language that was in it. I really felt it offensive. I was glad to hear in your open statement that you said you spoke on behalf of the mothers of your church, the Catholic Church, of which I am one of those, a member. Um, I, over the last three days, I've taught more of my role as a mother than anything else, even as a legislator, and about my four beautiful daughters and uh, my wonderful, handsome son which on occasion comes to myself or my husband for guidance or for just to, uh, to talk about different issues. And I've always believed, as, as my religion has taught me, that there is a God, there is a loving God, a compassionate God, and it's based on love. And my, after what I've heard today and over, the, over this evening as well, I will base what I'm going to say back to the committee on what I've heard and on the fact that there is, I believe there is a loving God. Uh, to Dr. Uh, Michael Jackson, you are right. Um, uh, no abortion is desirable. Some cases may be necessary. However, I don't believe anybody in this chamber or any member of the Dáil or the Senate believe that widespread abortion is, is, is going to be brought in. I have a question. Okay, thank you. And my question is to you all. Um, do you believe that we as legislators will use prudential judgment in infor informing legislation from these hearings, and I'd like an answer on that. Thanks. Ms. Nocton. 
Thank you, um, Chairman, um, and can I welcome all the, the presentations, and in particular, uh, Dr. Jones. Um, I have two, two brief questions to, to Dr. Jones. The, the first one is in relation to the current Medical Council uh, guidelines, and you've made the point that uh, those guidelines should be enhanced rather than introducing primary legislation. My understanding is that those guidelines over the last three editions uh, have actually extended the circumstances uh, for termination uh, and based on that uh, would we not be facilitating a further extension of the grounds for termination into the future secondly you make the point that there should be a referendum and, and correct me if i'm wrong but that there should be a referendum to turn overturn the x case judgment in relation to the suicide aspect uh, if that is the case should there also be a referendum to deal with the interpretation that we were given here yesterday by the legal experts uh, that 43.3 of the Constitution, based on the Roach case, uh, allows for the termination uh, of pregnancy uh, where there is a fatal fetal abnormality? Thank you. Deputy Robert Dowds. Uh, Two days ago, we had medical experts in here, uh, several masters of ho hospitals, maternity hospitals, and they were urging us to legislate because of the difficulties in which they have to operate. Whatever legislation uh, we produce will be pretty restricted because of the uh, 1983 uh, alteration to the Constitution. So could I, could I ask that the Catholic Church in particular uh, goes back and looks at this issue as a, in a fuller way than they have done so uh, up, up to date because life is not always as straightforward as, as we would like it to be and we as legislators have a duty uh, to act uh, to, to sort out the difficult situation uh, in which we find ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. My last point is, in, 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 in particular reference to the Catholic Church, I know that over time their position has, has changed in, rela in relation uh, to life, and I understand that Aquinas, who I think is regarded as the greatest Catholic theologian, uh, had a somewhat different view uh, than is currently being expressed by the Official dumb in the Catholic Church. Thank you. Deputy Seamus Healy. But, uh, <clears throat> and to thank the uh, witnesses for their uh, submissions this morning. Uh, just one, one question. Uh, a number of the submissions have um, indicated a concern uh, that the introduction of legislation in this area might lead to more wide, widespread availability. Um, and particularly referred uh, to the position in, uh, in England. Um, I'm just wondering uh, 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 to the question to the, to the people concerned, uh, in view of the fact, is that not unfounded in view of the fact that we operate on the basis of a written constitution uh, and that the test uh, being suggested here is one of the probability uh, of a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother? as against the test in England as uh, being uh, in relation to the threat to the health of the mother. And in those circumstances, is it not unfounded that there would be a concern that there would be a more liberal regime? Thank you. Deputy, um, De uh, Deputy Regina Doherty. Right. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming in this morning, but specifically I have um, a question for uh, Bishop Smith and uh, Father Bartlett. Um, Sorry, Bishop Jones. Bishop um, Smith, your own bishop. Yes, sorry. Uh, apologies. Um, Who did well with Hector the other night? Given that um, the Church acknowledges that there should be intervention when there's a real and substantial th threat to the risk of the life of the mother, and given that suicidal ideation or intent is acknowledged as a genuine substantial risk to the life of the mother, I'm curious, and I'm looking for help and suppose guidance as to how the Catholic Church would inform us to deal with that scenario, given that the X case judgment said that it was only allowable where every other avenue had been you know, explored, and it was only allowable as a last treatment. And so if you wanted to genuinely rule it out, and I understand and appreciate why you do from you know, a, a life is sacred perspective, 
What's the scenario in that case where a doctor or a psychiatrist is faced with no other treatment to treat a lady or a 14-year-old child in any circumstances where there's no other choice or no other treatment available? I'm at a loss to see that given that life is sacred, that if we were faced with that scenario, then the Catholic Church's option is to have no option, which leaves both lives potentially at risk. If you could help me in that scenario, I'd be very grateful. Uh, Deputy Peter Fitzpatrick. <coughs> First of all, I'd like to welcome you all here today. I'm sure that we all agree that Irish hospitals are among the safest and best in the world, and that our doctors, nurses and, mid and midwives do a great job. I want to ask uh, Dr Jones, uh, would he elaborate on three issues? The first issue is that the Catholic Church has stated that they have never thought that the life of the child in the womb should be preferred to that of the mother, and that mother and child are two patients. Also, uh, I want to know, could you elaborate more on uh, the medical intervention. You stated that the medical treatments which do not directly and intentionally seek the end to the life of the unborn baby. And the last thing is, uh, would you elaborate more on the abortion? You said the direct and intentional destruction of an unborn baby. Thank you. Uh, Senator McSharry. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Cahirlik, and uh, I welcome all of the witnesses here and thank them for their presentations. Um, over the last number of days, we've heard, obviously, as people have been saying from the medical opinion, uh, and clearly one of the issues that many of us, and certainly I, will struggle with is the whole issue of suicide. Uh, and the psychiatrists in recent days uh, seem to be agreed on the fact that for every 100 suicides that they predict, only three will materialise to actual suicides. Uh, and could I ask, uh, therefore, the panel, and in particular Ms. Good and perhaps Mr. Nugent, um, uh, that in essence what that may mean is that for every 100 abortions, if we were to legislate for it, that were authorised or deemed to be appropriate parts of treatment, that in effect eh, only three would have been necessary eh, on the basis that for every 100 suicides they predict, eh, only three would materialise. Eh, and I'm interested just eh, in the various churches, uh, and in particular uh, Ms. Good and Mr. Nugent's, just view on that uh, and if they could comment on it. Thank you. And finally, Senator John Crone. <coughs> Uh, again, I will if, beg the indulgence of the visitors and, and speak while sitting. I'm a little bit too tall for this microphone. I, I have a couple of rather focused questions, and I, I really would like to direct them to um, uh, Bishop Jones and, and Father Bartlett. Um, at this point in time, we've heard numbers that we don't have exact figures on it, but it, it would appear that we have approximately 30 terminations of pregnancy conducted annually in Ireland for reasons of threat to the life of the mother. Um, it is likely that none of these have been because of suicide, although we're not sure. It is also the general consensus of the obstetricians who've testified to us that under the current constitutional situation, they believe that they're not aware of any case where a woman has been denied a life-saving termination because of an ethical or religious scruple on the part of the doctor. So, Given the fact that medicine is getting a bit better, I know mothers are getting a little bit older, it's likely that we're dealing with a phenomenon which, under the legislation which will be proposed, under the current constitutional and judicial framework, will apply to approximately 30 people per annum. Now, the objection which is being raised, and most of the objection is coming in truth from uh, Roman Catholicism and both from the organized church and from, you know, sincere members of the laity who, who, who would subscribe you know, to the, to the uh, teachings of the church, is that somehow this number will increase dramatically. Yet you have said to us that you do not believe that there will be an abuse of the system by women spuriously claiming to be suicidal or by doctors spuriously diagnosing suicidality in order to impose social abortions. So what is the mechanism that you believe will lead to this incredible increase in abortion? I, I'm just troubled Thank to you. know what it is. I can't work out hypothetically what it would be because I don't believe the Supreme Court, given what we have already in our Thank Constitution you. and what will come in our statute books, will actually interpret it differently. And finally, one subsidiary question. I would like each of you in turn, my, our esteemed guests, from to tell me on behalf of your organizations, the Roman Catholic Church, Anglicanism, Presbyterianism, Methodism, Sunni Islam, and Orthodox Judaism, in each one of your organizations, is a woman allowed to rise to the top job? Thank you. Thank you. That's, that, that's not... That, that, that's outside a remit, uh, Senator Crown. However, we, we, we'll, we'll take note of the question. Thank you. Okay, we, we, have, we have 20 minutes remaining in this section, so in this segment of the meeting,
So if we could focus in on the questions and if we could divide the time. So I start with Father Battle of Bishop Jones, sorry. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll just make a couple of opening comments and Bishop Jones will supplement on this occasion. Uh, and obviously it's impossible to address every question that's been answered in detail in the time given, Chairman. So I'll do my best just to touch on a couple of th threads that are running through. Uh, someone mentioned there that life is not always as straightforward as we would like it to be. Uh, that's absolutely true. And there's no one in this room who doesn't know that, who hasn't experienced it, and hasn't had to deal with it. And in particular, if I may say, as well as the professionals involved in this area, clergy and faith leaders of all traditions, uh, deal and uh, are operate in that, that territory as well on a daily basis. Similarly, uh, just as it would be wrong to caricature anybody else in this debate, you know, I, I would just appeal to you not to caricature uh, people in churches, whatever their position in those churches, as somehow unhuman, unfeeling, detached from their own families and the real circumstances of life, including nieces, nephews, sisters, who might have to face these kinds of situations as well. So I just ask you to at least accept that. So what we're saying, therefore, is coming from the midst of that messy situation. It's not detached from it in some abstract way, but when we confront the messy situation, it is then in particular that moral values, laws for society, and in our case, our faith, are critical in the midst of the complexities to guide us through. And in that regard, I just want to come back to a question that was raised there about, you know, as legislators, it suggested that if there's a risk of even one woman taking her life uh, in suicide, then you have to legislate for that. Well, we need to respond to that with absolute compassion and the greatest professional care we can to protect that person from harming themselves and indeed another. But if we believe in the equal right to life of the unborn, as stated in 40.3.3, we should be equally concerned about the direct and intentional killing of an individual human person, equally concerned. And with respect, that brings me to the core of the concern of the Catholic Church on this matter and the concept of widening up the possibilities. It is a fundamental human right, not based on faith, based on our very shared humanity and our common dignity inherent to us as human beings, that we have a right not to be harmed by another if we are an innocent person and, not, and to have our life and its integrity completely respected. Once you move away from the principle that it is absolutely wrong in any circumstance to directly and intentionally take the life of an innocent person, which is what the X case judgment opens up. That's the cause of our reaction. That's the dangerous territory that is opened up in terms of appeal and challenge to any legislation you try to impose to restrict the terms of the X case judgment. That's our concern. Once you move over that line morally as a guiding principle, then you open up, and with respect, we're seeing it everywhere not least in this state, the pressures and the possibilities that in other scenarios, whether it's end-of-life care and so on, that precious, precious, and sometimes challenging and difficult moral principle, as moral principles and law sometimes are. They hold us back from doing what we might even think is the most compassionate and the best thing or the most expedient thing or whatever. So that's the thread of concern that's at the heart of our concern about the X case, it crosses that line in principle. When you start to legislate, then you have to legislate for that possibility. That's at the heart of this. Finally, uh, just in relation to, to a doctor who uh, might fear going to jail and the whole issue of guidelines, it is possible in Irish law, as we say in our, in our uh, submission, to produce guide, professional guidelines that are reviewable by the courts uh, without getting into the necessity to legislate. Once you legislate, and this is what I want to say to my colleagues who are talking about legislating, maybe to give doctor security or something. In principle, there's nothing wrong with that. But as I say, once you start to build it on the X case judgment, the problem is you have to take account of the scope of the X case judgment, and you're going to cross that line. You have to, or at least if you don't, it'll be challengeable. Dr. Jones, you make a brief remark? Amanda Henry's question. What would I have to, or how would I respond to a mother whose uh, child has become pregnant through rape? And uh, as, as all of us would understand, that is a traumatic, obviously, traumatic situation for a young girl and for her family. Dreadful. And uh, 
what would be our response? Well, back in the 1970s, this is the only response I can suggest is that I was asked by the bishops uh, all over the country, but by in my own diocese, to set up the Cura Agency. And I wish I had time here to explain to everyone present the success of that agency and the compassion of that agency over the years <coughs> to help girls through horrific situations, which I am not um, having the time to outline for you. But I have no doubt whatever that if I could bring that young girl to that Hura Agency counselling service, I have no doubt but that they would help her enormously through that tragic and, uh, crisis in her life. Also, of course, we'd all want the person, the violent person who inflicted that horrible crime, uh, we'd want that person brought to justice, obviously. But again, in keeping with our, our determination, you know, that every life is sacred, that there's no circumstance in which the taking of a human life is justified, we would claim that we must protect, too, the innocent, voiceless, powerless, uh, unborn child in that womb. And the solution, you know, the solution to take that life is no solution to the situation. Finally, if I could just say another word, I think it's referring back to Dr. Crown's question. Um, how can we guarantee it won't escalate? Or why are we so concerned about uh, if we introduce abortion that it won't escalate in, in time? First of all, I would just ask you, in the light of all our discussion, just to reflect on a few things. Reflect on... Dr. Patricia Casey's research on 600, 600 births in the three major hospitals in Dublin, 600,000, 79 deaths, and two of them were deaths to abortion, but postpartum, after birth, depression after birth. Sorry. Pardon? And the other thing, really, we have to ask ourselves, and why ignore it? Someone made an excuse for there for England. I mean, we have David Steele, the man that introduced, that introduced the bill in England in 1966, regressing it now when he sees what has happened in England in terms of the escalation of abortion. We have Jane Rowe in America, who is responsible for the, for the abortion in America, telling us, and now a campaign for pro-life. So, we've got to listen uh, to what is there already and to the evidence all around us. Thank you very much. Dr. Jackson. Um, the Church of Ireland, as I'm sure everybody knows, would be episcopally led but synodically governed. So what I would like to do is to give uh, the first instance, uh, Mr. Harper, an opportunity to say something, and I may add something. The question in relation to women in the top position. Now, whatever one considers to be the top position in the Church of Ireland, I think we can leave that. But it has been our uh, option since 1988. I would just say that. Okay. <laughs> You shouldn't rise, Senator Crown's bait. <laughs> Look, thank you. Uh, the point of difference, I suppose, in some senses, is this point on whether legislation or not. Yes, regulation is very good, and the Medical Council's guidelines are excellent on reading them. However, when read in conjunction with the 1861 Act, they are quite daunting. And certainly daunting for a mother, a woman, and her medical advisors, psychiatrists or others, as they read the two in conjunction. And this is why we feel that those regulations need the support of legislation. Some others have talked about justiciable uh, regulations. We feel the most definite way of having those is through legislation. And therefore it can be worked. However, Yes, there is sympathy, and there is a reality about opening gates, whatever gates they may be, in introducing that legislation. But the measure of that legislation will be how it controls the situation. Yes, in other jurisdictions, it has got out of control, as we heard, by even those who introduced the legislation, uh, in their opinion. However, we believe that our legislators have the benefit of those people's experience to make sure that it comes right. We do not envy you your task as legislators, but we do have confidence in you to do it right. 
And what we would say to you is that there must be that balance. And if we take Senator McSharry's point on the 3% of threatened suicides actually coming, the measure of the legislation will be how it identifies the 3%, not opens the door for the 100%. And that is going to the measure of legislation. And we do need, we do, need to, to do that in the interests of caring. This is not about legislation. This is not about rules and regulations. This is about how we deal with very sensitive and serious issues. This is how we protect the care and balance the care for the life of both the unborn and the mother in this case. But it is also, it is also how we protect those professionals that, and the parents in these very serious situations. And we have to accept the integrity of these people and provide the framework within which, within which they can operate. Thank you. Thank you. You have been yeah, I, ju I just want to add um, an increasing concern that I have generally, not actually of our gathering this morning, but over the past three days, including today, is the way in which suicide is becoming a third person thing. Suicide is always a first person thing. And uh, throughout Ireland, we're very conscious uh, of the turmoil and the torment for individuals and for those who love them and care for them and people who actually do not love themselves. I think it's very important that we should remember something which I think was said earlier. Statistics up to 130,000 women over a period of many years have actually had abortions. These people have, if I may use the phrase from another context, joined the disappeared. We're not in a real sense able to assess the torment through which they went and there is a tremendous concern on my part that whatever legislation, regulation comes through, that there is an ongoing commitment to the sympathetic support of people who for whatever reason go through with an abortion because the torment continues for the individual and if we turn it into something which is simply third person it's not actually real to the human situation that's all i want to add thank you thank you Ms. good thank you well my covenant partners in the church of ireland have said largely what i feel as part of the methodist church um, the care and protection of both the mother and the unborn is is of course uh, primary and as um, Bishop Jackson said, the care of those, the silent, the unforgotten, we need to remember them. I didn't quite catch the statistics that was mentioned, um, something about the 3%. 3% of 100 3% of actually 100% goes to suicide. And I hear this, that it's only a small number. It comes up in the media all the time and, and from different people that it's only a small number who threaten suicide and even a smaller number who maybe actually commit suicide um, because of uh, pregnancy. I think the Irish state has proven in many ways over many years in different ways that it cares for the individual. And we don't not legislate just because there's only one person. If there was only one murder in the past hundred years, we would still have a law saying murder is wrong. Therefore, even if there's only one woman in the next ten years who is, uh, is, is exposed to the risk of suicide in her life because of the pregnancy, it would be wrong for us not to have legislation to protect her. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Nugent? Yeah, with regard to the question of maternal suicide, uh, each case has to be treated on its own merits. When, when you're a doctor treating a patient, you can't treat that patient on the basis of what may happen in other cases. Uh, we've heard from evidence earlier in the week that maternal suicide is both rare and also an overall leading case of uh, cause of maternal death. With, and, and with regard to the legislation in that case, crossing a line, as, as has been mentioned, if you're concerned about that line being crossed of legislation for suicide. It's already been crossed. The X case itself has crossed that line. Abortion is legal in Ireland for women who have a real and substantial threat to their life, including the threat of suicide. Your job is not to decide whether that should be the case. Your job is to regulate it by legislation. Thank you very much. Dr. Salim. 
Well, as, as I have stated in my suppression, that the life of mother and the life of the baby, as both of them are of great value, but nevertheless, I would say that if we have a group of competent medical professionals who can tell us that, yes, this puts the life of the mother uh, at danger, then the decision of abortion can, can be taken, but only in this case, I would say. Thanks. Thank you, Rabbi Lent. Thank you. Just to address... Um, the issue of uh, the fear that legislation for suicide will open the floodgates. Um, I think everyone in this room would be cognizant of the fact that any uh, woman who's contemplating a termination finds herself uh, not, in a, not in a good place, whether or not that termination uh, takes place or not. And I think that we have to approach this from a, a point of compassion, um, of feelings for, uh, for that woman, and, and trust in our medical professionals. As a father of four children born here in Ireland, um, I think we do have to place our trust in the medical professionals that they will be able to, to decide when this is genuine uh, and when it's not. In terms of the percentage, uh, the, the low percentage of, of uh, suicides, three out of 100, uh, I, I hope we can give a large credit uh, for that uh, low number to our mental health professionals, uh, which is a credit to them. But from a Jewish point of view, every single case has to be taken uh, on its own merit. And if there is um, a, a serious risk to the life of the woman, uh, then intervention, in, intervention is, is recommended. And just in, in response to Senator Crown's point, um, I could maybe recommend have a, a quick leaf through the Old Testament. You'll find large amounts of powerful women that were judges and prophets uh, throughout uh, the history of the Jewish people. Thank you. And uh, Reverend Dr. Moria. I, I think it's fair to say that you've heard from the Abrahamic faith an, an unreserved commitment to the sanctity of human life as a starting ethical principle uh, for a just and stable society. Secondly, I, I think it is recognized that abortion is being practiced in, in Ireland today. Otherwise, those in the medical profession would not seek some form of legislation to protect them because of the 1861 legislation. On such a basis, you must realize, therefore, that those of us who are committed to the sanctity of Hitler are concerned, and in response to the question of the potential floodgates being opened through such legislation. When that is raised, and, and it is a genuine concern, it is not because there is any question about the integrity or commitment of, 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 of the moral ethos of the Iraqis. David Steele, in fact, who introduced this legislation in, in the United Kingdom in 1967, was the son of a Presbyterian minister. Uh, his intent was social justice, uh, for, for particularly for women uh, within that society. But because, and this is the concern, there is and has been over the years changing ethical approaches to abortion within society, and particularly throughout Western Europe and the United States of America, that is creating a context where the future could be somewhat uncertain. Let me just for a moment, if I may, give you some quotes. Uh, from the Hippocratic Oath, I will not give to a woman a pessary to produce an abortion. In 1948, I will maintain the utmost respect for human life from the time of conception, even against threat, and that's from the Declaration of Geneva. In 1947, the spirit of the Hippocratic Oath can be affirmed by the profession. It enjoins the duty of caring, the greatest crime being the cooperation in the destruction of life by murder, suicide, and abortion. That was by the BMA, the British Medical Association, in 1947. In 1959, the child deserves legal protection before as well as after birth. That's the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child. But by 1970, things began to change. Therapeutic abortion may be performed in circumstances where the vital interests of the mother conflict with those of the unborn child, which is a declaration of Oslo. And then 1983, I will maintain the utmost respect for human life from its beginning. That was the amended declaration of Geneva, so that by the year 2000, in the Royal College of, of, of Gynecologists in Britain, abortion is seen just as a basic health care need. What I'm doing in giving those quotations is the description of a change of climate, a change of culture that is taking place. So that the fear is that when legislation is passed, it will contribute and add to this and create a context which will be detrimental to the sanctity 
of human life. Thank you. As the time for the 60 minutes has elapsed, uh, we're going to move to members of the committee. I'm sorry, Senator Brock, our 60 minutes is up and I have to be... Engaged about regulation. I, I, uh, if, if, if regulation is brought in, under what, piece of no. under what piece of legislation can the regulation be brought okay, in? That's the clarification. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll come back to that in, in the questions and answers. So there's 20 minutes now for non-members of the committee and I have nine members who've indicated and we have 20 <laughs> minutes and I want people just to be in 60 seconds, please. Uh, Deputy Eric Byrne. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my question is to uh, Dr. Jones. Um, uh, there were disturbing reports uh, around the uh, death of Savita Halapanavar. That, that particular issue, because there's an investigation at the moment, and I don't yeah, want no, to no, have no, just, yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. But uh, we will be conscious in newspaper reports that uh, this lady on applying or asking the medical profession uh, to terminate her uh, pregnancy. Sorry, I'm not allowing that question, Senator Deputy. Sorry. Okay, the, the, aside. okay, thank you. Uh, then the question is um, that it was suggested to this lady that it was a Catholic country. The lady, as we now know, uh, was Hindu. So not relevant, no. Sorry, no, no, I'm not it's very relevant. Fair. No, it's very relevant. In fact, I think it's more than relevant. Okay. We are legislators. Sorry, I appreciate that, but it's not relevant to the discussion today. No, no, no. There's so an investigation going on, and I would prefer not to discuss that, and I would ask it not to go on that line. Okay, I'll please. leave that out of it. Thank you. You, please you heard what I had to say, know. but the question, therefore, is... Uh, to Bishop uh, Jones. Uh, this is a Catholic country. 84% of people profess to be Catholics according to the last census. And would you confirm for me that you are, abdicate, you are uh, suggesting to us as uh, legislators that we listen and implement the Roman Catholic Church's <laughs> ethical and moral teachings and that we apply it to our hospitals? Thank you. If that is your case, would you explain to me then, as legislators, given the diversity of religious views we've heard here today and opinions, uh, how you would instruct Catholic legislators to deal with this issue? Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Deputy, or Senator Fidel one minute, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman and panel of witnesses. You're very welcome. My question is to Mr. Michael Nugent, the Atheist Ireland. I do note an overly prescriptive tone. And uh, maybe Ms. Heidi Good could also respond to this question. Given that we know a baby can live outside the womb from 24 weeks onwards with, uh, with appropriate support, where is the compassion and the human right and respect for the fetus who can live with support outside the womb if the X case sets absolutely no limits, no time limits, even up to 40 weeks? How can you justify this? according to your ethical beliefs thank you where on, and where is the compassion in that and in this regard would you not agree that x is flawed thank you deputy terence Fanagan. Yes. Yeah. one minute just to thank uh, the witnesses obviously before uh, that came that have come before the committee uh, can i ask a question there for bishop jones and father bartlett uh, of the catholic church you say that when a seriously ill pregnant woman needs medical treatment which may indirectly put the life of her baby at risk such treatments are morally ethical provided every effort is made to save the life of both the mother and her baby. Just to ask about the cases there where the death of the baby is foreseen as inevitable. Perhaps you could comment on that. Uh, for Archbishop Jackin, Jackson of the Church of Ireland, uh, your submission indicates that there's a variety of opinion within the Church of Ireland on what constitutes exceptional cases. Can you give some indication to the committee of that variety of opinion? And on what grounds do you believe that the Medical Council guidelines are insufficient to ensure that women receive life-threatening medical treatment in pregnancy? Thank you. Deputy Bernard Durkin. One minute, Deputy. Durkin, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Durkin. Uh, could, could I ask, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Dr. Jones, uh, three questions. One, in the event of a further referendum, which presumably would be to set aside uh, the judgment in the yes case, is it envisaged that that referendum would set aside the decisions of the people previously in two referenda whereby the provision in respect of suicide was retained? That's the first question. The second question in respect of rape. Is it the position of the Catholic Church that the victim of rape, which in itself is a criminal offence, an offence against the person, is expected to live with the consequences of that rape, regardless of her wishes. And in the case of an underage person uh, 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 in statutory rape, or in the case of a person with special needs. And the last question, the last question is, 
Is it accepted that legislators should be expected to validate the decisions of the medical profession in, when faced with situations whereby, as already has been pointed out, there may be a question as to whether the life of the unborn may be sacrificed in order to, in order to protect the life of the mother. Whether this is accept acceptable or, or if it is intended or, 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 or if it is anticipated Thank you. that such, such a situation might be determined in a further referendum given the experiences of the past. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Senator Jim Walsh. Thank you, Chairman. My first question is to Bishop Jones and Father Tim Bartlett. Uh, you say that the progressed non statutory uh, just as I will, guidelines that clarify current practice uh, with the two-patient model. Could I ask that if it were possible to construct legislation uh, which would, in fact, underpin current medical practice in that area without including suicide, uh, how would you feel in relation to that? My second question is to Archbishop uh, Jackson. Um, you talked about the 1861 Act. Uh, have you taken into account uh, the, the, the presumption within mens re for indictable offences uh, and the defence, you know, where people are acting in good faith, which would cover both mother and doctor? Um, do you believe there should be no sanctions for illegal abortions, or do you think the level of sanctions in the 1861 Act should be lower? And the number going to England, undoubtedly women go in crisis, Dublin doctor told me recently, he's a woman that's going for her fifth or sixth abortion. Thank you. Finally, to Miss uh, Good, uh, can I just say, you recommending that we would uh, provide for abortion in cases where there is a risk of grave injury to the physical or mental health of the mother, which are the grounds that operate in Britain at present, Sen thank you, where Senator. we've seen 6.4 million, 200,000 a year, and the comments that have been made by Lord Steele. Do you not think that that has achieved a situation where four, uh, Something like four out of five pregnancies, uh, you know, end in uh, abortion, and that that's an unacceptable level. In other words, gives a 20% chance of a, of a baby being aborted. And my final point, oh, very very time, time. Time. could I invite each, of, them, unfair, not each of our witnesses to talk about the continuum of life, Thank which you. is dependent on the preceding Calling part Deputy of that Thank life, you, Deputy, you've which in fact is a biological fact. Thank you. In other words, if you're abrupt like Sorry, at any Senator, stage, come on. Uh, it's an arbitrary the members. decision. Thank you, Chairman. You'll be unfair to the members now. Thank you. Deputy Michael Creed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Cahirlik, and I'd like to thank the witnesses for their uh, presentations, and there is a lot of food for thought there. I have just um, a couple of questions for uh, Bishop Jones and for Father Bartlett. Uh, Bishop Jones, in his uh, presentation on page 2, said, and I quote, It is therefore our view that the most efficient and morally acceptable way of progressing, of responding to ABC versus Ireland is for government to consult with professional bodies to progress on statutory but justifiable guidelines that clarify current practice within the two-patient model of maternity care. This is current pra best practice in Irish hospitals. It is internationally recognised and celebrated. That's referring to the Medical Council guidelines. He went on to say in, in his off-script uh, words that, uh, the Medical Council guidelines should be enhanced, and Father Bartlett said life-saving treatment is available at present. I think they're both all variations of a team which kind of reflect the status quo. But could I quote for him the status quo is underpinned by the Medical Council guidelines, which read as follows in respect uh, of abortion under 21.1. It says, and I quote further, these are the Medical Council guidelines. Abortion is illegal in Ireland except where there is a real and substantial risk to the life assisting from the health of the mother. Under current legal precedent, this exception includes where there is a clear and substantial risk to the life of the mother arising from the threat of suicide. You should undertake a full assessment of any such risk in light of the clinical research on this issue. Is the church effectively saying, therefore, that it is happy to... Uh, please let me develop the point, uh, Chairman. Is the, court, is the church saying that it is happy, therefore, to have the carte blanche arrangement as envisaged for treatment of suicide as a threat to the life of the mother, unfettered by any regulation or legislation. That it doesn't, it, for example, impose an obligation on the medical practitioners at the moment to consult, to seek a second opinion. It doesn't put restrictions on the time limit within which a termination can take place. I mean, is, is the level of disdain for the legislator to rein in and, and, and to put a framework um, on, on the, those guidelines such that you feel we shouldn't trespass in this area at all. 
Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Master, the clock and Kennedy. Thank you, Cahirlach, and thank you to the witnesses for the presentations here this or today. Uh, the first question I have is for Bishop Jones and Father Bartlett, and uh, I just wonder how widely they've consulted with the women in the uh, church, and if they have, what is the mechanism for being consulted uh, on this very significant issue of women's health? And secondly, I want to ask the question uh, also, uh, uh, Bishop Jones referred to the distinction between medical intervention and abortion and I'd like an explanation of what that distinction is please and also I wonder do uh, you agree with um, comment here by one of the legal experts uh, during the week that uh, the definition of life is uh, a life that is capable of being born or where is it is at the moment of conception some of the other churches have been clear on what they see this is and I wonder if you could clarify that for me thank, thank you. you Senator thank you Senator Vanabachik one minute. Thank you, Chair. We've heard over the last two days the consensus from independent legal and medical experts on the need for legislation for the X case. And I think Atheist Ireland are right to point out that uh, three days of parliamentary hearings shouldn't be necessary to discuss how the law should allow a doctor to save the life of a, of a dying pregnant woman. Just questions to the Catholic uh, representatives in that context. To those of you, those who oppose legislation for the X case, isn't that opposition based on an underlying belief in the innate deceitfulness of women and a misogyny towards, uh, uh, towards women? Uh, Secondly, where is your compassion, and I've heard you speak this morning about compassion, where is your compassion for the teenage girls who are victims of rape or incest, who become pregnant as a result and are suicidal as a result of that, as we saw in the X case and as we've seen subsequently? And finally, can you say what business it is of a church whose members are entirely and exclusively male and celibate to pronounce in such absolutist terms on such critical issues about the reproductive rights and reproductive health of women and of girls? Thank you. The church has been up both men and women, by the way, just point of clarification. Thanks, Senator White. Very briefly. Margaret, um, <clears throat> I'd like to put on the record today this, I believe we're on, it's a momentous event here in the last number of days, and an equally momentous event here was when we brought into civil partnership, into law. It was a very moving uh, occasion. And I have a, a question for the Catholic Church if priests were, Catholic priests were allowed to marry, as in the other institutions, members we have here, and if you had a, a daughter, perhaps you might feel different about if your daughter was raped or abused, that you would demand and insist that she would carry the pregnancy through to fruition, to the delivery of the baby. I find it, to be honest with you, I find it very difficult that men can can speak uh, in extraordinary forthright as if they know everything. Thank How you. do they know what women feel about thank if you, they're Senator. raped or abused and become pregnant by it? Thank you, Senator. And finally, okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll now hand back to our witnesses. Um, and I, I know we've only got eight minutes left, but if you, we can... What about Thanks, Chairman. And again, I'm sorry, I can't respond to every question, obviously. So I'll, I'll again try to get a thread that's running through, and I'll, and I'll, I'll attach it to the question about are we asking you as legislators to legislate for a Catholic morality in this country? The simple answer is absolutely not. As I said earlier, the principle of the right to life is a human principle. It's a human rights principle, and that is the starting point of all of this discussion. Uh, and also within the uh, distinction that somebody asked about between licit medical intervention and the distinction that we make between that and abortion, medical intervention to save the life of the mother is possible. As we clarified in the opening statement, perhaps you weren't here at the time, the Catholic Church has never taught that the life of the mother should be preferred over that of the child or that the life of the child should be preferred over that of the mother. We have already stated repeatedly this morning, medical intervention to save the life of the mother uh, is morally licit, as long as every effort is made to continue to protect and save the life of the child, even if, in the practical circumstances, that may lead to the death of the child, unintended as that is. And some people have suggested that this distinction between direct and indirect and intended and unintended is again some kind of Catholic moral principle. Go to our courts. Our law acknowledges that moral culpability or legal consequence is weighed up against intent, direct or indirect consequences. So this is nothing in that sense to do with specifically Catholic uh, moral theology. And with respect, with respect, this is the first stage of this debate in which 
I have been caricatured. And I mentioned earlier that I think we should avoid that kind of caricature. Uh, I, I, it might surprise you to know that I know a lot of women in my life. There are a lot of women I love dearly in my life who, if they had to face these circumstances, I would feel deeply about as well. So I just ask that you wouldn't uh, caricature us, just as myself and Bishop Jones haven't caricatured anybody else, and no woman has ever called me a misogynist. Thanks. Uh, <coughs> uh, Dr. Jones, you want to make a comment? Sorry. You okay? Okay. Thank you. Sorry.